So procedural languages have improved since people started programming computers. You know, we started with machine code and then moved to assembly and then C code and, and so on. Um, notably, the, the, the first, I think, really big improvements were libraries, functions and libraries, the concept that you don't have to constantly repeat code over and over again. Of course, that eventually evolved into object-oriented programming. So now you could move beyond just a simple function call. You could encapsulate data and methods and what have you in a single place and repeat that over and over again. What that turns into is now you have code that you can easily factor, which means that code reuse becomes really easy. So why is this important? I tried to find the source of this quote, and unfortunately I failed, but it's, it's something that I think says volumes, that society is able to advance by increasing the number of things or the complexity of things that you can do without thinking. What does that mean in today's world? Well, uh, back when cars were invented, you had to go through a whole bunch of stuff just to get the thing running in the morning, whereas today you just turn the key. Uh, washing clothes, it used to be you know, a half day or an all day process, now you throw them in a machine. Uh, you don't worry about all the logistics of trying to go from Chicago to California anymore, you just worry about the logistics of getting to the airport, which is a lot easier. So what that translates to for computer scientists is that code reuse means that you can do more complex things without thinking. You can become far more productive. Imagine trying to write Windows using nothing but assembly language. So enough about procedural coding. What's improved with database coding since the 1970s when relational databases were created? Pretty much nothing. Uh, one of the most used tools that we still have for doing database coding is cut, paste, replace. Um, it's. It, this kind of database development methodology has really continued because we don't have the advanced things that modern procedural languages do. We don't have, uh, we do have functions, but we don't have things like classes and libraries and what have you. Um, so just as an example, look at, look at a simple uh, lookup table. Uh, what process would you use to, to duplicate that kind of intelligence for another case? Well, First, you'd find an example you could use. Then you'd copy and paste it. And in this case, I showed the, the example was the customer lookup table. Well, now we'll, we'll replace customer with something else. So what's wrong with this? Well, first of all, it's tedious. Um, it's time consuming. And oops. Uh, it's tedious. It's time consuming. And it's error prone. It's, it's easy to mess that up. And the problem only gets worse as the complexity of what it is that you're trying to duplicate or reuse increases. So if you look at the example of an actual lookup table, at least as we use them, uh, there's obviously the table itself. There's the grants on the table. There's uh, a number of helper functions that make it easier to access the data in the table. And there's unit tests. So if you're going to cut, paste, replace, that's a lot of code that you actually have to worry about trying to do that with. So when you're dealing with real world code duplication, it becomes almost impossible to do all of that and not mess it up. It's also not possible to add a new feature to all your examples of that duplicated code with any kind of ease. So, for example, say you started using these lookup tables and then you realized, hey, it'd be really cool if I had a function that made it easy to access the data. Well, if all you've been doing is cut and pasting, you now would have to manually go through and try and find every single one of those tables and create all those functions by hand and add all that. So, hopefully that explains what the problem is. Now the question is, okay, how do we go about changing this? Well, unfortunately, real change here would require changing the database engines that we, actually, that we use um, to add support for things like classes. 
Oracle has, in many ways, gone the farthest in this direction of any other database because they have packages. So you can create a package and you can have functions in it and you can even have some data structures in there. Um, but it's, it's only one small component. Uh, and of course, I'm not patient. I don't want to wait for my database technology to catch up to my everyday needs. So let's see what we can do with the tools and the capabilities that databases already provide to us. So what are our weapons here? Um, starting with some simple things like just creating some simple helper functions all the way through things like data inheritance. So I'm going to walk through these right now. So helper functions, and, and I, I put this in here for the sake of completeness, but I really hope that people are already doing this. And really what this boils down to is if there's any way that you can avoid the cut and paste, don't cut and paste. Create a function. Um, create simple functions that let you do things repeatedly and not have to worry about them. I mean, many of these, you know, calculating the length of an array, you're subtracting as two functions calls. It's not like there's anything magic to a helper function that does that. But by encapsulating in a function, you don't have to remember all that. You just call the function simple. Again, the big thing is don't repeat yourself. Take the, take the half second of extra time and create the function. And the other reason I mention this is that at least when I started doing database development, I would get so much in the mindset of the cut and paste that it was very easy to just automatically, oh yes, I did that over here, I'll just grab it and cut and paste without necessarily thinking, well, wait a minute, I can create a function to do this, this is easy. So the next tool that we have is a concept called metacode. You know, what's the idea here? Well, computers are really good at doing repetitive tasks. So why don't we have them actually write the code for us? Okay. Sorry, first time using Keynote, and uh, <laughs> um, so let's make let's make the computer actually write uh, write our code for us. So, how would we want this to look? How would we want this to operate? I think the first goal would be that you know we need to make it easy to use. So we want to make it easy to create new database objects. We should also be able to track these objects. And we want to track these objects so that if we, in the future, need to do something different with them or, you know, add a function, make some kind of a change, that we can actually modify things. So easy to create. Ideally, it should just be one simple function call to give us everything that we need. So going back to our trusty static lookup table, um, you call one function. It creates a table that allows you to normalize data, uh, you know, like a simple status field, uh, create all of our indexes, assign our permissions, and call other metacode functions that then create helper functions for us. So not only does this metacode example make use of the concept of, hey, let's, let's make this easy to do this complex thing, it actually relies on other metacode that does smaller, simpler things. So clearly this is something that's fairly well factorized. Um, the other thing that you can do with metacode is maybe you have examples where you don't need to create a whole bunch of different objects, but there's something that you do when you create an object that it would be easier, uh, you, the, the syntax uh, the SQL syntax doesn't make it very easy to go about um, creating the object. So in Postgres, functions would be an example of that. So we have metacode that we've developed that allows you to create a database function. It makes it easy to change the permissions on that function, and it makes it easy to add a comment to the function. Now, if you've ever changed function permissions or dealt with function comments, one of the painful things is that you need to repeat the entire header of the function definition so that the database can uniquely identify which function it is that you're talking 
about. By wrapping all this capability into a simple function, if we tell the function, hey, here's the header part, here's the part that uniquely identifies this function, it can repeat that over and over for you. So you don't have to cut and paste and replace, you can make one function call and do everything that you might need to do when it comes to defining a function. What about the tracking? Um, the way that our metacode system works is that any metacode objects that we want to actually track, they're built from templates. These templates contain tags that can be replaced, that the framework replaces for us to give uh, actual SQL objects. So, for example, going once again back to our trusty lookup table. When I call the function select code dot lookup table, uh, it's actually lookup table static, uh, loan statuses, that function uses a template that says create a table, here's the name of the table, here's the name of the fields. After the tag replacement is done, this is the actual SQL command that results. These slides will be posted, by the way. I see some people in the back straining. Um, so the, the, how does this allow the tracking? Well, when the Metacode system creates an object for you, it stores those templates. And when it actually creates the object, it remembers not only the template that was used to create that object, but it also remembers all the parameters that you passed in. So you can always go back to these tables in the, in the Metacode system and figure out what objects you've created because you know what the template is and you know what your parameters are. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that the tracking is optional. So what we discovered is that some things like, for example, functions, it just seemed really unlikely that we would need to change that template. So we switched that over so it doesn't actually track anymore. So why do we worry about the tracking? Well, we do that so that we can actually modify metacode that we've defined. Um, so the way that we do that is that all templates are actually versioned, and each template version also has an upgrade template. So if you start with the first version of lookup tables, and then you say, hey, I want to add these, these getter functions to it, you'd create a second template that would be version 2, and as part of the version 2 template, you would have a separate upgrade template that the system can run to say, oh, hey, uh, we have this lookup table over here. It doesn't have the functions. My upgrade template says all I have to do is call these other three metacode functions, and boom, now this, meta, this lookup table is now on version 2, and it's got this, the exact same definition as if we had just created it off of version 2. Um, we also have templates that, that tell you how to drop objects. So when it come, if, if you get to a point and say, oh, we're not going to do that anymore, we're, we're going to denormalize this or whatever, uh, you can very easily with a single function call say, oh, okay, all this stuff, drop it. We don't need it anymore. So that's two of our weapons that I've, I've gone through so far. Um, the next one I want to talk about is the idea of components. So the metacode works well for things like give me a function or give me a table with some indexes or what have you, but what if you actually want to refactor larger, more complex parts of your system? Components allow you to do that. They are basically libraries of code. Or another way that you can think about them is they're like pound and include in C. So a component is comprised of a number of database schemas and all the objects that are contained within those schemas. So you can have tables, you can have functions, you can have whatever you want. Um, each component has a set of specific roles that are used for ownership 
and permissions. And the reason that we have those separate roles and permissions is so that all the code and the unit tests are kept, are separated from other components. So if you have component A and component B, component A will operate with a different set of roles and permissions and it's, its objects cannot directly go messing around with component B. Likewise, your application, if you assign the permissions correctly, your application code can't just go using willy-nilly whatever is in the component that may be there. You can actually assign these permissions so that you basically have the concept of public versus private uh, objects in your components. So what are some things that you could actually do with components? Um, well, the first thing that we did was we said, you know, all these helper functions and, and our metacode tools, all this stuff that we've developed to make it easier for us to do database development, we'll take all of that and put it into its own component. And that's what we're actually publishing here. And this allows us to say, oh, hey, I need to create a new database for a different application. Well, all I have to do is pull in my DB global component, as we call it, and now we have all the tools that we're used to dealing with. It's, it's one database, three databases, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're able to pull that as a complete entity into a brand new code base. Uh, something else we're looking at is basic tracking of, of personal information. So if you have different applications, they may be doing very different things in different databases, but much of the data that you need to track basic information about people, like their names, their addresses, their phone numbers, what have you, that's pretty standard. It doesn't really need to change that much from one application to another. Uh, something else that we're looking at is, is our accounting system. Uh, one of the ideas of, account, of an accounting system is it should just work no matter what your business is. So if you've developed uh, tables and functions and what have you like we have for, for dealing with accounting, we can take that and break that into its own component. Finally, there's data inheritance. So this, this is something that's quite unique to databases and in fact, as far as I know, it's unique to Postgres. This allows you to reuse not only code, but it actually allows you to effectively reuse data. So how does this work? Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's, this is something that is actually built into the database itself. So Postgres makes this available to us. You can create, when you create a table, you can make it a child table of one or more parent tables. As a child table, the table will actually inherit its definition from the parents. And a child table can also add its own unique definition. The powerful thing here is that by default, when you query a parent table, you will get records from all of its children. So if any of you have looked at doing table partitioning in Postgres, this is the exact framework that the partitioning uses. But when people do partitioning, they don't normally look at the extensibility aspect of it. So for a more concrete example, uh, this, is, this is something that we actually have in our application today. Um, we do lending, so obviously we need to be able to deal with customers' bank accounts and their debit cards and, and other ways that we can move money to and from our customers. Well, if you think about just bank accounts and debit cards uh, and how you might want to store those in a database, there's going to be certain fields in those tables that will be common no matter what your payment method is. So for example, you might have some kind of a, a surrogate key, we call it payment instrument. Um, you presumably want to associate the account with a specific customer record. Um, and we actually use a type ID to say, oh, this is a debit card, this is a bank account. Um, your child tables, on the other hand, will then vary based on what the type of account is. So for a bank account in the 
external world, the, the two key things you need for a bank account are a routing number and an account number. So when we create our bank account table, we say, hey, give me a routing number, give me an account number, and inherit from payment instruments. So that means that if you look at this actual table, not only does it have routing number and account number, but it also has uh, it also has the fields from our parent. Sorry. Uh, so our bank account table will have payment instrument ID, customer ID, payment instrument type ID, and then it will also have routing number and account number. Similarly for debit cards, same concept. Debit card, you don't care about routing number or account number, you do care about a card token uh, and an expiration date. So there's some downsides to the table inheritance. One of them is that not everything inherits. So indexes, for example, uh, if, if you have an index on payment instrument ID in the parent, you very likely want that to be on all the children. Unfortunately, the database does not handle that for us. The flip side is that sometimes you want things to be inherited to some children, but not all of them. And that's something else that the Postgres by itself does not provide. Unfortunately, we do not have cross-table indexes, which means you cannot do a cross-table unique index. So for example, we cannot put a global unique index on payment instrument ID to enforce that a payment instrument ID can only appear in one place in one of the children and that's it. Since you don't have the ability to do cross-table unique indexes, you also cannot do foreign keys. Now a child table can have a foreign key that relates to another table. So for example, customer ID can refer back to your customer table. But if you have something that needs to refer to um, the generic concept of a payment instrument, you cannot create a foreign key that just says, hey, I'm a foreign key to payment instruments. Well, you can, but it will only look at the parent and there's no actual data in the parent. So how do we deal with, with these, um, these downsides to using table inheritance? Metacode, same kind of concept that we use for other things we can use right here. So we've created metacode specifically for dealing with inheritance issues. Um, this metacode allows defining what objects you want to appear on children and you can also exclude children. So if you want a null constraint or what have you, you can, you can have that appear on children by default and give it a list of here's the children I don't want this to be on. The system, uh, just like our other metacode, it just uses tag replacement. So the system itself is, is quite simple um, in its operation, but the big, the big power that you get is the ability to uh, define things once, and then as you add more child tables, you no longer have to worry about making sure all this stuff has been added. Now, we set all this up with the intention of using it for actual inheritance where there is differences in table structure, but you could also just use this for partitioning. So if you're using table partitioning and you say, hey, every single one of these partitions, I want to have this set of indexes, uh, or maybe I want certain sets of permissions, you can use this system in a partitioning scheme as well. So just as a review, these are kind of the the different tools and capabilities that, that I've talked about. So the, the tools are one thing and, and all this is available and I could go into far greater detail on the operation of all this stuff. But I think the really important concept that I wanted to get across to people today is to ask yourselves, what am I repeating over and over? When I'm going and working on my database schema, what is it that I find myself cutting and pasting, or doing the same thing all the time. Well, at the end of the day, why does this all really matter? 
So at, if you remember the title slide, I had boldly put up there, increase your database coding productivity by a factor of 10. Well, here's where I actually got this from. So looking at our, our lookup table example, again, what does this do? It gives us a table. It gives us the permissions. Um, it marks it as seed data, which is something we use for our dump framework, um, our, de our development database build framework. Gives us some functions, and all of this stuff is unit tested. So if you think about it, that's a pretty fair amount of code to actually cut and paste over and over again. So when I got sick and tired of cutting and pasting this and, and said, OK, I'm going to write a framework to do this, it took me about three days to actually create the generic metacode framework. It took me about another two days to actually create the, the actual lookup table implementation and the other metacode functions that it depends on. As of right now, we've used this metacode in our database 97 times. And actually, that's only in our main application. We've used it other places as well. So I would argue that it would take 15 minutes for you to actually go through and cut and paste this stuff. So to go find the latest example, grab it all together, paste it somewhere, do all the replacement, do the same thing with the unit test, and then hope that you haven't made an error any place, that's going to take you 15 minutes. Well, 15 minutes times 97 uses, that would have been 24 hours worth of effort for what we've done today. So just in our use, we've paid for the framework. We've also paid one and a half times for the development of, of static lookup tables. Um, we have a different version of, of lookup tables that actually allow you to add data on the fly. Uh, when we realized we needed that, it took us about eight hours to develop it. We'd gotten a little better. We were more comfortable with the framework. Um, so far in our main application, it's been used 17 times. Because this is more complex, I don't think you could cut and paste it in 15 minutes. I think it'd be more like a half hour. So right there, that's eight and a half hours. Again, we've already paid off the time that we spent just to develop the, the functionality. But it's kind of misleading to focus on the payback of, well, how long if I put effort into writing this once will it take me to pay it back? To me, the real difference is the time that it takes, that it saves you in your everyday world. So let's say that you got really, really good at all this cutting and pasting. Let's say you could do a complete cut and paste and modify of the lookup table code in five minutes, which you'd have to be really good to do that. How long does it take you to type select code.lookup table static CNU loans? Sorry. Uh, uh, how long would it take you to type code lookup table static CNU loan statuses loan status parentheses semicolon return? Well, I can tell you because I timed it took me 16 seconds. And I'm a fairly fast typist. So that's 19 times faster than if you were doing this with cut and replace. But let's take it one step farther. How long does it take you to type that out? Well, it took me eight seconds. This function gives me a denormalized view on top of our loans table. That function also goes in and introspects on the table. It looks to see what foreign key fields in this table are pointing at lookup tables, and it uses that to create a view definition. You cannot cut and paste that. It's not possible, because it's actually looking at what you have defined on that table at that point in time. So again, this goes back to what are you what are you repeating over and over and over this is this is the thing i want everybody to start thinking about so that you can use the weapons we've developed and you can develop your own weapons to work smarter and give us more time at the bar 
So I know what you all are thinking. Wow, that's awesome. How can I get all this stuff? Uh, we have open sourced this. Um, it is a it is an evolving product. I mean, every time that we come out and we say, "Oh, hey, we need to do this," we add capability to it. Um, I'm certainly not going to pretend that this is the only possible way that you could do it, or that it's necessarily even the best possible way that you can do it. This is why I kept saying, you know, think about what is it, what is it you're repeating, because you don't have to keep working that same way. You, you don't have to keep taking the hard road. You can use our tools to get out of that trap, or you can, you can write your own. But anyway, questions? So we've used our, our lookup table static 97 times. Um, that one, I, I don't think we've actually had to make any changes to it because it was, it was fairly simple. It was easier to see you know, what we wanted to do. But let's say that we did need to make a change. We can create a template that creates the second version of that. And part of, that, part of creating that template would be saying, Okay, if you have an existing lookup table, here's the code that you need to call to make this change. So I didn't show that we have a description field, which ours actually does. Let's say you wanted to add that description field. So for version 2, you would create your new template that, that includes the description field, but you would also create an upload, I'm sorry, an upgrade template that would say alter table paren uh, look up tail, I don't remember the exact tag, but you would use the tag, so you'd say alter table, the tag for the name of the table, add column, description, text, semicolon. When you put that into the framework, now you can say, okay, give me the list of every single lookup table that we've created, and run the upgrade for all of them. So, you would be able to upgrade every single instance that you had created simply by create the new template and then run a single function that says, oh, okay, I'm going to upgrade everything. Is that? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the templates are really, really simple. Um, and, and I don't want to give any... I don't want to give the impression that, you know, we're a bunch of rocket scientists because we figured this out. I mean, all we did was we took the cut and replace and we put it into a framework so that now you can just, instead of cut, paste, replace, you say, okay, here's a tag and you tell the framework, here's what I want you to replace this tag with. So at the end of the day, that's really all that you're doing. But because it also stores, well, here's what we originally passed in for tags, you can then make use of those tags in the future when you drop the object, when you upgrade it to make a change, what have you. Right, right. So it's, that is something that in and of itself, this framework doesn't necessarily help with. So to me, the reason that it's so painful to change a database is because it's not like code where you just change the code and now you have your new code and okay, great, life goes on. Databases have code or structure, but they also have data. And that's the part that, that makes performing those changes really painful. So at that point, it becomes a question of what is the change that you're actually trying to make. So if you're just trying to add a field or per, you know, maybe change a data type, or maybe if what you're operating on is very small, then you don't have to worry so much. You know, those alter commands that I mentioned, they'll, they'll run really fast. But uh, if you've used this to create, uh, say, for our dynamic lookup tables, where you can actually add stuff on the fly, 
those can get big. And I know that in our system, we've got some that are certainly over a gigabyte. So to run an alter table on those that would have to rewrite the table, we would probably have to figure out some other way to do it. But we're working, we, we actually have a backfill framework um, because we're very concerned about the, the cost and the pain of downtime. So because our backfill framework, again, is, is very modularized and has been made easy to use with uh, an easy to use API, we could actually, in an upgrade template, say, okay, we're gonna do this upgrade, but we know it's gonna be painful, so don't just do alter table. You know, alter table, leave the field null, and then create this backfill. And have the backfill just automatically run in the system, and whenever it's finished and it's migrated over all the data, the backfill can then go in and say, okay, I've done my deed, make this thing not null, and we should be good to go. So the, the, the whole concept that makes all that work, though, is that instead of just trying to brute force everything and just come up with a complete one-at-a-time, one-off solution, we're always thinking about how can we make this easier? How can, how can we make it less painful to deal with this? The, the backfill system that we have originally started as just really crude shell scripts. And we've over time evolved it so that now we're very close to it has an automated daemon. So all you have to do is, hey, I'm registering this backfill. The daemon picks it up. It goes, runs the thing, deals what needs to be done, and life goes on. So other questions? So if I understand what you're asking, you're, you're saying that basically this system is at the end of the day, it's still just repeating code over and over? Right. So I think the thing that, that I've learned the most is that when, when you're trying to create a generic system that allows you to do the same thing over and over, the API to that system becomes really, really important. Because if you put too much flexibility into the API, you you almost don't gain anything. You know, if, if you have if you have an API where to create a new metacode function or whatever, where you have to call five other functions, well, <laughs> that's that's a lot of code that you know that that's not really helping you. On the other hand, if you make too many assumptions in the API and it's too high of a level, then you end up in a situation where oh, yes, I can use this to do the, oh, wait, no, it won't let me do this because I don't have the ability to get at what, what I really need to be able to do. So um, I, I, I think the big lesson there is, is just focus, focus on the API. Um, what we generally do is we will create the low-level functions that we know that we need and then we create higher level functions that wrap those together so that you have the best of both worlds. Normally you just use the high top level function where it's one call, it's as simple as you can make it, but then if you actually need to go in and make a change and do something special, you actually can go under the covers but still get the, the power that you've built in. Write the method, select last name, write the method, select 
data file, right? And that's like select current position. And then they do for each record. Right. <laughs> so like this, like this, like that. And uh, that's uh, like what I saw, like when I saw similar, like similar system, like slide of some like application that was like the biggest issue because we not always we can really like packaging functions copies and paste because then we lose. Uh, we might be in on uh, our coding productivity, but Right, right, and and it's a trade-off, you know, and that's that's where ORMs came in and said, hey, well, we'll we'll make it easier so that you don't have to, you know, define all these classes with these getters and setters and whatnot. But then, of course, the flip side is, um, you do limit your flexibility somewhat. But, and and this is this is true of all these tools too, you know. You now have a bigger hammer in your hand. You went from a smaller hammer to now a bigger hammer. So if you start swinging that around wildly, you can do a lot more damage. And that's that's what I think you know drives a lot of database people nuts when it comes to dealing with ORMs, is they try and just gloss over the real problem, at least in my opinion, and and they try and basically just hide it from developers. Well, just hiding it doesn't do enough of a, you know, you, you can't just hide it because at the end of the day, you're still talking to a database. So if you have something that runs 30,000 queries to go pull up one web page, that's not good. <laughs> uh, other questions? Well, let me just mention for any of you that are here local in Chicago, we do have a Chicago Postgres users group. My company um, sponsors that. Uh, we will be meeting this Wednesday, though the intention this Wednesday is to give this exact same presentation again. Um, but certainly, if nothing else, just come by and have some free food and drinks and meet some other local Postgres people. So there's no other questions. I think I'm about five minutes early, so I will stick around if anyone wants to ask. But other than that, thanks a lot for your Attention. That's, and I guess that's why I kept saying, right, 